Good morning, good afternoon, and evening, baseball fans. Welcome back to Barstool Baseball, blah, blah, blah. My name is Carl. I am fucking dead right now. Clemmer, welcome to the show. Fuck Say Suzuki. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say off the top, I think, so we're referencing uh, Suzuki missing a fly ball in the eighth, allowed two runners to score, just a horrible, if you haven't seen it, if you're hearing this early, you haven't seen it, check it out. It's a must watch. Um, so I think there's two ways this goes, Carl. Option re- A. You guys end up making the playoffs. This ends up kind of being a footnote. No one remembers it. I will say, though, and I'm a neutral observer. I was watching it live. Option B, this is historic. And if you do lose the wild card, this is the play people remember because it just looks bad. It was just everything bad. And poor Suzuki, you were devastated afterwards. I guess I want your take as a Cubs fan. What, what do you... Uh, well, I, I would I would just caveat off the top. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. I'm keeping it together. Like I said, I'm hanging on by a fucking thread and say Suzuki's over here flossing his teeth with it. It is not a pretty sight here at the Barcelona Chicago office. As, as a Cubs fan, I'm gutted and I'm balancing this obligation of I want to keep vibes high, attitude rolling, part of that energy we put out there. Like I don't want to be the guy who comes in here, season's over, and but – can we be realistic? Because the Cubs have five games left in the season. Two are at Atlanta. Three are at Milwaukee. Like you're not. They could win the next two games. They could win the next two games easily. They were up six to nothing with the number one pitcher on the mound tonight. You like never in a world did I think. I didn't think. Let me take a step back for a second. I didn't think I'd see Drew Smiley pitch the eighth inning in a one run game under these circumstances. They trust him, they went to him, he struck out Michael Harris. He had Sean Murphy up with runners on second and third and Sean Murphy lobs the ball into right center. Suzuki called off Bellinger in center and Suzuki's a great outfielder. So historic, yeah, I think I think it has the makings to be behind Brant Brown. Brant Brown dropping a ball in 1998 to clinch yeah. a playoff spot so that the Cubs had to go play the Giants in a one game was – is that the worst? What do you, I think this is up there for one of the worst ending – I know it's not the last game of the season. It's not a playoff game. But this is, this is like a Merkel's boner. This is like we're going to be talking about this 50 fucking years from now. I know baseball history. This is not going to – this is – there's no way the Cubs – no way – Within that context, the Cubs come out of this. As a fan and the guy who does Barcelona, hey, let's go Cubs. Like, yeah, sure, Cubs are fine. Like, no, fuck. No, we're fucked. We are fucked. So I don't think you are. Um, And Ray Brown, they still made the playoffs that year. Yeah, got swept by the Braves. I don't know. I was at at game three. They got swept. Yeah, well, yeah, but Carl, that's not fair. The 98, <laughs> the 98 Braves were honestly underperformed. They should have swept everybody until they got to the Yankees. And they, they, the pod race beat them. You know, Kevin Brown went, went crazy. So, like, so there is – there can be redemption is what I'm saying. Now, this is a huge game. You said this is last week. They are in a crazy race for this wild card spot. Even losing this game, your season's not over. But, you know, that's a little bit kind of like me telling a Red Sox fan in 1986, oh, you still got game seven. I know Buckner fucked up, but it's like no one wants to hear that. So, like, this fucking loss sucks. And I will say just from a cinematic point of view, it was just – it's just a bad look. Like, optically, it just – it looks like what you see in a highlight, you know, 50 years from now when we have hologram TVs, people watching the – the 4K, you know, faded color, you know, him drop like it just it works, uh, you know, from that perspective as a, as a baseball historian. I don't think the Braves and Brewers are as scary as you make them sound. Neither team is playing for anything now. Brewers couldn't today. The Cubs slapped Bryce Elder around, slapped him around. Justin Steele's on the mound, must win game, don't win. Six nothing, don't win. Sure, show up tomorrow, you can play tomorrow. Like, not winning today. Like, there's not another 6-0 game on the schedule, guys. They don't just happen. You're playing the Bra- – Who? how many times has a team been up 6 nothing against the Braves this season? How many times this season has a team had a 6 or more run lead against the Braves? I would bet it's less than 10 fucking times. Oh, yeah. I, I would bet. How many times have they had that? And then you've had, like, a guy like Justin Steele on the mound. And you lose. So, it's just – 
it's not just losing. If they got their asses kicked tonight, then you go home and you're like, whatever, we got our asses kicked. Right. Like, they're they're going to be eating brunch tomorrow talking about this thing. Like, say Suzuki's going to be taking a shit 20 fucking years from now thinking about this, much less before tomorrow's at bat or game. You know, and then it's like, well, you sit him, do you not sit him? So, anyways, listen, I'm very worked up, but I have an obligation as a professional, as a host of Barstool Baseball. We showed up. We want to put a good show together. I don't want to sit here and bitch about the Cubs nonstop. Off the top, Huh. after the Cubs, is really the NL wild card, though. Yeah. So I'm going to kick it back to you while I catch my breath. And kind of how does this Cubs <laughs> – I can't believe I'm about to do this. I'm a professional. I can do this. How does this – how does this Cubs loss impact the playoff landscape from your perspective? Look, I, I – Get it, man. I've been there. I, these losses are emotionally gutting and stuff, but it is just one game. And I know that's easy to, for me to say, but it's important for Cubs fans to hear. Like, it is just one game. And they're, like I said, the Brand Brown, they still what? Like, you can come back from these things. You can also not come back from these things. Um, Suzuki, in his last at bat, looked horrible. He struck out, flailing. Look at disaster. But you get a good night's sleep. You wake up. It's a new day. We'll see what his mental strength is. This Cubs team is good. Um, and I do actually kind of like. The fact they're playing all teams of nothing to play for. I think that's that's not the worst in the world. Now, what's huge, big picture wild card, is doubleheader Mar- Marlins Mets. The Mets completely fucked this up. The Mets ground crew, I gotta say this year, has not been stellar. All year long, the grass has had like dead spots in it. It just hasn't looked great. I don't know. I, I my wife and I have both been saying, like, this, this grass is, doesn't look that great. Well, they fucked up the biggest time of the year last uh, last tonight, or when people here in it last night. It, we look. We had horrible rain all weekend. Uh, tropical storm Ophelia kind of came near us, but it didn't really rain today. And the ground crew couldn't get the field ready, and it's because of that, they had to cancel the game, though it wasn't raining out. So now the Marlins are forced to play a doubleheader today. Smells funky. Smells like something's cooking behind the scenes there. I don't owner, know. It, owner it, owns it, a favor, flood the field type stuff. Leave the sprinklers on at three a.m. Crazier shits happen. It helps you guys. Because now the Marlins have to kind of like, you know, their they're, they're starting rotation is kind of a mess. Yuri Perez is out for the year. Sandy Alcantara is out for the year. You know, they're kind of, you know, they have good players like Braxton Garrett and Cabrera is fine. They have, you know, obviously Rosardo is nice, but they don't have that true ace. They're going to have to like kind of re, re-juggle this pitching rotation now to fit in this extra game. I don't know. I, I don't think that bodes well for them. Um, you got the Dimebacks who are about to win when we're taping, they're up by like eight runs. They're going to win that game. So they'll have the leg up on, on the Cubs, obviously there. Uh, and then you had the Reds winning today, but I think it's too little too late. I mean, you have a, their, you know, tragic number is four. I don't know if they have enough to come back because they have to leapfrog over the Marlins and then the Cubs. I think it might be too much to ask. I don't know. I think it, for me, it's probably down to Marlins, Cubs and Dimebacks with Dimebacks have that inside track now. And just to boil down the assumptions, um, or to get, I want to get into the substance here, but I do want to come up to 30,000 feet for a second and just say again, it's the Braves one, Dodgers two, Brewers three, Phillies four. Yep. So we're figuring out who the fifth and the sixth team from the National League is going to be in. The Diamondbacks are in the fifth spot now by a game. The Cubs are half a game up in the sixth spot on the Marlins, but the Marlins still have a game to play. So I, I do think there's... Actually, I don't think there's an advantage. While you were talking about the Marlins, I was thinking to myself, I would love to be a Miami Marlins sitting right now watching the Cubs lose the way they played. I'm all fucking jacked up. I'm taking the field tomorrow like, dude, the Cubs are dead. Did you see what just happened to them last night? We win this first one. They're on their heels. They're cooked, dude. So, but I, the talent and the substance at this point doesn't matter. There's five games left in the season. Like, it's really um, about, it's really about like, do you, can you execute under these circumstances? And I think I, it also has to do with who you're playing against to some extent too. Um, you know, for instance, like playing the Red Sox right now, the American League, that's great. They're fucking, they're just, they're just giving out. Like they completely packed it in. So, you know, we see this, you watch enough baseball enough years, some teams just pack it in. Like they don't give a fuck. It's, it's kind of wild to watch these teams like wave a white flag, uh, you know, with like two weeks left, but it happens. It happens in every, every profession, I'm sure. Um, it might, it's hard to be a professional when, you know, you just kind of play out the strength. Um, but so I think some of that really matters. So, you know, looking at this weekend series, because this is where it gets interesting, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday stretch here. So 
Um, we have the the Cubs play the Brewers, like you mentioned, in Milwaukee. Brewers have nothing to play for. Cubs will have everything to play for. Um, I think that's that's not the worst opponent to have. Now, the other games to mention here are the Marlins, who have, excuse me, the Pirates in Pittsburgh. Pirates are not a good team, but they've been playing great. Um, Derek Shelton has a team playing really well. They have one of the best, I think we've said it a few times on, on Barstool Baseball, how good they've been the last two months. Like, they've been playing competitively. It's the opposite of mailing it in. you got to give Derek Shelton credit for that. Like, he has his guys ready to go. Even though McCutcheon's out now, like, they've lost a lot of guys. But even, like, Mitch Keller had a nice start. You know, like, those guys are playing hard still. Yeah. And I think that's good for you. And I thought that's a nice counter look at it. I don't know if I'd call it a benefit, but it's a good different side of the way I'm coming at it, where I think the world's falling apart. Hey, slow down a second here. You're right. The Pirates have been very competitive since, I want to say it's the second week of August, if someone wants to pull up the exact date. Yeah, it's about that. Yeah. Derek Shelton, too. That's like that's my guy. I've been talking about Derek Shelton for like as long as as long as he's been hired and I heard a sound bite and got to do my research on this guy. I've like Dan Campbell in the NFL. That dude just loves his guys. His guys love him. They're dogs. At some point, if he can get enough young players and Bob Nutting sells the team or they spend money, I do really like the Pirates. And completely off topic, now that we bring it up, I'm excited for this off season's 2024 like Pirates preview. Like that's a team I have a pin in for next year. Right now, right now, Marlins got the edge. Marlins yeah, are playing okay, for so- something, foot on the gas. Like when I say it comes down to execution, what I mean is this. The Cubs came out today with passion. They got a flat Bryce Elder and they slapped his ass around. 6-0 lead and it comes down to execution. So like yeah, of course Suzuki drops the ball. But even letting him back into the game and being sharp and all that shit. I can't believe the Cubs took their foot off the gas. And so, I know, we're off the Cubs. I'm just worked up. You so, think the Reds are out? Let's get there. You think the Reds are out? Yeah, I, mean, I just think it's, it's not enough time. Um, now, in regards to the Cubs, they have Justin Steele pitching Sunday again. And in regards to the Marlins, the Pirates will have Mitch Keller pitching again on that Sunday. So that's another positive thing to look at for the Cubs. It's like, all right, we're going to have our good guy go, our best guy go on Sunday. The Pirates are going to be pitching their best guy. They've got nothing to play for. If, if Keller's doing really well in the seventh, they're going to leave him out of the eighth. If he's throwing a shot. Like, so, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll maximize him. And we've seen, if you watch enough baseball, you see a lot of kooky stuff happen that last, that last game. You know, you might see guys go throw hitters, go complete games, go some of these kind of crazy stuff. So something to keep an eye on. The other one we need to look at is the Astros are playing the Diamondbacks in Arizona this weekend. Astros will potentially have something to play for here. Although, as we speak, um, they are playing the Marlins, uh, the Mariners right now. Uh, they won a huge game on um, Monday with Verlander completely showing up like old school Ver- Verlander. And they're playing right now at a 0-0 in the third. So we don't know how that's going to go. But let's assume the, Mar- the Mariners can stick around that series is going to have some potential too. So that Diamondbacks Astro series could be really one to watch this weekend. You're the perfect guy for me to be talking to right now. Cause you going through these matchups, this is exactly the type of logic to offset the insane emotion that I have going through my head after watching that. Well, it's always easier when you're, you're like, when you're not emotionally involved. Like I, I like the Cubs, you know, Justin Steele's a great guy. I like you, Carl. So like I root for them, but like I'm not emotionally invested like you are with this. So you can be a lot more rational and just kind of take it. And what, my team's been out of it for months. So I, I've been very logical and rational now for months now because I, I have no emotion tied to anything except for just sadness. And this is a state of mind I've been doing my best to avoid on this programming. So if you haven't seen this side of me yet, welcome guys. I'm a fucking lunatic. I'm a lunatic. I'm an absolute lunatic. That's the NL wild card. Now I will put my objective thinking cap on and let's slide on our way over to the AL wild card for a second. Do do we have a good look at four, five, six? Four is going to be, and when I say four, I mean that's the first wild card yes. team. Is going to be the loser in the AL East, which appears to be the Tampa Rays. Yeah, I think we can pretty much say that. I mean, the right. tragic number for them is three now. It's over. So um, Wait, that's the second time you've done tragic number and the first time I've heard it in my life. So is that? Oh, it's the opposite of a magic number. It basically means how many 
until you till you're done, till your season's over. So right, so I guess I could. I'm kind of a glass half empty guy. So I could say the Orioles have a magic number of three, but I like kind of looking at it, especially when you have number of different teams, especially like the wild card race. You got a bunch of different teams fighting for it. It's easier to say tragic number because then you can relate uh, individually to that team as opposed to the, the the top of the food chain. That makes any sense. Yeah, no, we just we just came full circle when we did our first snake draft together, and I was like, "This morbid motherfucker, you are half cl- you are tra- like if you had a choice between magic and tragic, of course you're going to take tragic." Okay, so we're back to the Orioles uh, or the race. Tragic, <laughs> tragic numbers four, three, three four? now because okay. the Orioles won tonight. Where people here, this excuse me on Tuesday. So um, by the way, the Orioles are probably still on pace to win 100 games. If they go two and three the rest of the way, they will win 100 games. Pretty amazing considering that they were losing 110 games every season for like. It felt like decades and it was only a few years, but amazing, amazing job they've done this year. Um, okay, so the really so the AL East is done. The AL Central is done. You gotta start to wonder if the AL West is is over. Um, the Rangers might have this. Okay. What is your feeling about that? Yeah, the the I said when they came out of the losing streak, winning streak, losing streak, back into the winning streak, they they've been doing this tap dance tango thing. I thought the momentum like right to close the season. They looked great this weekend. I thought they won four in a row at the time we did the power ranking recording. And so it was like springboard momentum stuff. I I think the Mariners also suck too. And I don't think the Astros... Let me cut myself off from a long-winded answer. I think the Rangers are a slam dunk runaway at the time of recording, which is 10.50 p.m. Eastern time Tuesday night. So let me throw a curveball at you. It's the... Fifth inning, and somehow the Rangers are losing four to one of the Angels. Just one game, but if the Astros win this, the Rangers lose. Look, I don't know. Here's one thing I but do then, know. Sorry, about. the Astros. You brought it up. The Astros have to play the Diamondbacks this weekend. The Diamondbacks are just as hungry as anybody else is yes. out there. So that's good competitive baseball. That's not an easy sweep. If you want to project, I'd say that's that could be very competitive. The other thing too is going into the tonight's games. Tuesday night's games, excuse me. Like I said, we're taping this around, you know, it was before 11 o'clock, so now all, all the West Coast games are done, unfortunately. The Rangers, the the Mariners' tragic number to the Rangers is three. So the Mariners could lose today. The Rangers could lose. Now it's down to two. I, I'm very close to saying the Rangers are going to win the West, but I'm very confident saying the Rangers will make the playoffs. Okay, yes. I'm there. I'm there. I'm, yeah. I think it's... The AL teams that are in the playoffs are the Astros in the mix that we're talking about. The Rangers, the Astros, Blue Jays. Yeah, no? the Blue Jays look good. The Blue Jays are in a great spot. I'm not ready to crown them yet, but I probably should be. Because um, I want to they- kick the Mariners out. The Mariners, there's that's the mix of teams. I think there's four teams for those three spots. Yeah, right. If the Mariners lose today, that's going to make things a lot easier for us. Um, I think that I think if they lose today, I'm, I'm a lot happier crowning the Blue Jays because that you just want to do like a three hour show and wait till they win or lose, and we can. No, tired. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I do not. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I just, I, I don't know. I, I think, the, I think, the, I think we both agree the Blue Jays are in a really good spot, and the Rangers are in a really good spot. You know, like as far as making the postseason goes. Um, one thing to keep in mind: this weekend series. The Rays are playing the Blue Jays in Toronto. The Rays, in theory, by that point, will have nothing to play for. They have pitching issues. I could see them really kind of mailing those three games in, honestly. I think it's really good for the Blue Jays. We mentioned, the Rays would do that, too. The Rays yeah, would also, totally gut their pitching yeah. matchups and abandon that in advantage of rest and benefits. I will say the Rays actually gave me a call right before we came on. I'm actually starting on Sunday. <laughs> so it's, it's a tough spot for them. What is your pitch mix? Give me your, if you have three pitches, what would be the three pitches you would want on the mound? Uh, I only throw submarine style. So um, I throw a submarine, what I call a clemmer twist, which is a little right before I chuck it. And the other two have a nice little to it. So really only two pitches. And one of them is a pitch that I invented on my own. So um, it's going to be a wild night on Sunday, but I'm excited. Um, the Rangers are playing the Mariners uh, next weekend, this weekend as well. So that's obviously huge but with each passing day that has less and less intensity for me because the rangers just keep um putting themselves in better position especially against the mariners so that could be a situation where the rangers kind of have things locked up for their perspective 
on Saturday, but maybe are still playing to win the division, but the Mariners are playing for their life. Um, so that weekend, that's not, I don't know if that's an ideal matchup for the Mariners to have. Um, no. Or I guess the Rangers. No, I, I mean, I think the Mariners are, I think George Kirby, quote, killed them. But you go back to that. There's just been a downward, awful, horrendous trajectory since that quote, which sucks because George Kirby is a great pitcher who's done historic things in his young career, legitimately historic things in his strikeout to walk ratio, walks and number of starts, whatever the no, it's inc- no, you're absolutely are. right. Counterbalance that though, Carl. He's throwing three scoreless innings today uh, against Houston right now as we speak. I. I just like know for a fact that whatever we say about them is going to be countered effectively in the gameplay as soon as we hit stop. So if well, I say thing- George Kirby looks great, he looks gr- he's going to get his tits lit. If I right. say he looks like second, shit, right. he's going eight scoreless. So there's still some time to be played out. Well, this goes back to the Suzuki thing, honestly, where every single thing becomes so magnified. And this is what's kind of cool about baseball this time of year. Like, we play this long season, and for what five, six, seven of these teams we're talking about, even the Reds are still alive. They still have a pulse. Like we're talking about now the snapshot of a week, and then next week we're going to be talking about a snapshot of a three-game series where every single pitch matters so much, every single error matters so much, and that's kind of where we are now. We're talking about George Kirby in the third inning. Like we would never have had this discussion. No, giving a fuck. No, but now every pitch matters so much, and that's what makes this like must-watch TV. This is why. No matter what, I'm not going to bed until that last West Coast game is over. We're not usually at our anyway, but now I'm really making sure I stayed up. And I'll be doing that until the end of October, you know, and I know you will too. Like, that's just like where we are now, which is awesome. But like I said, it does kind of magnify things. And it takes some of the, I don't say analysis out of this, some of the cerebral part of baseball. It becomes more emotion based and it becomes more, I say, luck. But there is some luck involved. Like, you know, that's kind of where we are now. A lot of luck. Yeah. A lo- like Jeremy Pena was the World Series MVP last year. But, but he's even, the best player on the Astros. But he was really good for a short time. Not lucky, but he was like really good. And he was awesome. This is where we are. I just don't think there's a way to like remove the concept of luck from baseball. There's got to be a better way to describe it, though. Like really what we're saying is it's random. Or yeah. it's more random in a small data set. Where the Royals go out and they sweep the Astros for three games in a weekend. Look, wow. Look, Amazing. Look a big part of life. Like, that's just life. It's like old man life lesson here. Like, the secret to life is good timing. Like, luck is everything. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, anyone who's listening to this, if I wasn't lucky like 10,000 times. Like, there's 10,000 different ways things could have broken for me where I'm selling fireplaces in New Hampshire. That's like the, by far the most, if you're doing the choose your own adventure book, that's 80% of the answers is I'm, I'm flipping fireplaces right now. You know, so like it's all, it's all luck and putting yourself in the best situation you can possible and taking advantage of any opportunity you have. And that's postseason, baby. that's life. That's for all of us. Anyone listening to this, sure, there's moments in their life where it could have gone two ways and hopefully it went the right way for them. But that's, that's just life. And that's kind of where we are now. We're in mo- a snapshot. We're in moments of snapshots now where typically the baseball season is a full measure of things. We're past that now. I want to go back to execution because in these moments, the luck, the randomness, the pressure, all these players know what's at stake. Every every swing, every pitch, all the all these moments are played under that pressure. So I have tremendous admiration for the guys that are so cool about it. They don't throw harder. Their stuff doesn't get nastier. You know, it's not that – Oh man, he's on. It's the guys that just go out and just carry it all the time. Kyle Hendricks is great in the playoffs. If the Cubs get to the playoffs this year and he gets a chance to make a start, if it's a home start, game three NLDS at Wrigley Field, the the polish, the po- uh, the poise, the command at that time of year, like this, com- this brings it out of the players. And I'm I'm trying to think is like a. Segway because I know I'm going to talk about the managers and do some reviews on on managers and get I'm on gonna, the playoffs. But they, this is like a great platform for players to do amazing things. It is, but talent overrides everything most of the time. Like Kyle Hendricks was a really good postseason pitcher because Kyle Hendricks for a while was a really good pitcher. 
Like at the end of the day, you're right. There are guys like Jeremy Pena, you know, go through, you have kind now, of these I'm weird- pushing back right now on you when you do this because I use Kyle Hendricks as a fastball changeup example because he speeds the game up and he slows it down. He doesn't try and overpower you. He doesn't get on the mound and say like, my stuff is, he's just like, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm, I'm in a shoebox and whatever you do, you do. But I don't fucking change, man. And they get better. That's why I use Kyle Hendricks. But you're right. He was a very good pitcher at the time. But he's but I, also – Kyle Hendricks is also like a – I don't know. I've never really seen too many interviews. But the way he pitches, I'm guessing, he, he seems to be a very cerebral guy. Like he seems to be an intelligent person. Like if you watch his pitching, just how he does things, he always seems to be like thinking. So he's got three know, different – he's got three different change-ups. And he throws them in – ridiculous sequencing you know a righty that swung and missed at an earlier pitch gets a different change up than a lefty oh then a lefty on two strikes then yeah he's cerebral he's a weirdo people but, sleep on kyle Hendricks. the guy won an era title like he's he's a gang person. dude he is across baseball considered i love this term in baseball he's a fucking gangster like he walks in the clubhouse and says, who's this scrawny ass 6'3 190 pound weird hairy nippled dartmouth kid Who's just out there throwing 86 over the heart of the plate? Are you he kidding? You went to Dartmouth? Me? Yes. I went know. to Dartmouth? I'm terrible. I pitched, I pitched against his team so he, and, so he and shut him out. I, sh- I shut his team out. Wow. Yeah. Really? How about it? Dartmouth, blow me. If you're from Dartmouth and you're listening to this, this Southside Hillbilly from Chicago, gotcha. Um, Kyle Hendricks, though, his life turned out. He won a World Series for the Cubs. Bunch of historic playoff moments. I'm here in the Barstool Chicago office. 10 o'clock local time talking to you after, say, Suzuki dropped it right. Like, just ugh, cupcake in right field. Can we get some closing wrap-up playoff thoughts? I do want to talk about managers that are, like, yeah. kind of on the hot seat because I'm not taking – this is all credit to you. Like, I can't say this enough to the audience about how – it's just awesome talking baseball with you because your head is, like – you're just in stuff. You're, you're really fucking smart. And so as we were talking about the show, you were like, I really want to talk about managers because no one's been fired yet this season, which means in the coming week, we're going to see a ton of turnover in the big news. Like we should get out in front of it. And like, I'm not thinking about shit like that. So we do have some good stuff on managers rep or prepared. My closing thoughts on playoffs. Is there something, some spin, anything you want to put on this, any little fucking salad dressing before we get the managers? No, I'm, I mean, like you said, a lot of this is just excitement, emotion. Let's get let's get excited here. Let's have some fun with this last week. You know, we can do the best we can to kind of coach prediction to kind of figure stuff out. But shit also happens. Like the Reds went out, they got a shot. Like shit could happen, and it's such a small sample size now. Um, crazy shit does happen. So I'm excited for it. I'm here for it. I really think. I guess the one thing I'll say is I think the AL West matchups going into this weekend are more exciting to me than the National League wild card, only because the teams are all playing each other. Like, I just think that's... And then on top of it, you have the Astros playing the Diamondbacks. So, like, I feel like the National League is a bit more scattered, but it doesn't mean I won't be watching and paying attention to those games. I'm super excited. One thing I will bitch about, and I'm going to bring this up again on Sunday because that fucking pisses me off, Major League Baseball has to stop ending the season on Sundays. You have the football conflict. People are busy. And they're on a Tuesday or Wednesday when when you're the only show in town. I don't know why they keep doing this. It infuriates me. It didn't used to be this way when I was a kid. I hate it. Interesting. Why do they end on Sundays? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I want to shrink the schedule too. I get, we got to shrink this fucking thing. Sorry, I got to watch my, my F-bombs. We have to shrink the schedule. I don't hold off on the players union will never stuff. Players union will if money's involved. Yeah. There's got to be a way to get – the schedule from 162 to like 140. No, they're just yeah, they're at I one fifty on that. One four, one forty four. I a one fifty four. I walk kind of thing. Like it, they're records. They're records that mean stuff. No, 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 no. Because you've been sitting here talking about Ronald Acuna stolen bases this year. Well, yeah. pitchers don't pick to first base, Chris. It would be like measuring home runs if they stop throwing curveballs. Like, it's a fundamental shift in the way the game is played. So I can't recognize that statistic. If people started drawing more walks through a smaller strike zone, I'm not going to sit here and go, man, guy's got a, a historic OBP. They're doing it to us. They did it to us with the steroid era. It just It's a part of the game. So I want to live in the era where they were like, you know what, we're just going to make this easier for everybody. So, like, you're just going to have to compare it in your own terms. You're going to have to watch the players. We got video no. on everybody. Fuck no, you. I don't like that. 
I don't like that. I, I, the records should mean something. And yes, there are different errors. And you have to understand that and take that into context when you're looking at different errors and historical baseball stuff. But one thing that's kind of always remained the same is the amount of games that are played. Now, it was 154 until 1961 and went to 162. I'll be willing to go to 154 because it still holds true to me. But beyond that, I, w- I would be very upset. We did have one 144 season, 1995, because the player strike. And we were robbed of some cool stuff. Uh, Albert Bell had 50 home runs. Who knows how many he would have hit if he had played 18 more games. So, like, there's cool stuff that could have happened, and we got robbed from it because of uh, the player strike. If you bring up 1994 in my house, my my father, any any good, hard-blooded Chicago White Sox fan, like, yeah. they just – they forgot. They didn't know what happened. They blacked out. Jordan retired. MLB's on strike. Worst year. Quite honestly – you even just saying 94 hurt me on behalf of my father. Could have been a White Sox Expo. That would have been a great – that would have been a great World Series. Let's talk managers. Okay. And then I have a segment prepared for you called <clears> – I did, did I just clear my fucking throat in the microphone? I'm not editing that out. I just want to acknowledge it now because historically speaking, if I did something like that, I would try to edit it out. But we're just – we're posting this as it comes out. So I apologize for clearing my throat. I prepared a segment called I looked up a random old baseball player and came up with a question for you that I think you're going to answer perfectly. Okay. But we're not doing that. Pressure's on me. No, we're going to, we're, do you want to do that segment now? Let's just fucking do it now. Do it now. Let's rip it. How come Brett Saberhagen isn't in the Hall of Fame? He had two Cy Youngs at 85 and 89, led the league in walk to strikeout ratio, led the league in like innings pitch, was a workhorse at a time when guys weren't like really good starting pitchers. Like I know historically when you look at starting pitchers, Brett Saberhagen doesn't stack up to, you know, guys in other eras, but for the 80s, he was he was a fucking G. Two Cy Young awards and like 60 wins above replacement in baseball reference. He is the 57th out of there's 66 pitchers in the Hall of Fame under Jaws or whatever that score is. He's like 57th under the Hall of Fame thing. What what would what, Saber Hagen steal? Why isn't he in Cooperstown? Yeah, so one of my favorite pitchers growing up. I have a lot of thoughts on Brett Saberhagen. So Brett Saberhagen uh, in 1984 is a rookie, had an okay year. 85 has a great year. Wins Young. They win the World Series. He pitches game seven and they win. He pitches a shutout. He had this weird thing where every other year he was awesome. So then... 86, he wasn't that good. kind of hurt. 87, he was very good. 88, not good. 89, wins the Cy Young again. Incredible. Ends up getting traded the Mets for Greg Jeffries. Um, and uh, the Mets was it was kind of a disaster. He ended up, uh, was, had a uh, super soaker full of bleach and shot it at reporters in 1993. Um, he was, said he was joking around, but the reporters didn't find it to be very amusing. Um, 94, he was having a great year. The strike happened. He probably would have been, I think he was third in Cy Young voting that year. He would have had an amazing season, 94. 95, he got off to a good start again, breaking that every other year thing. Got traded to the Rockies. Didn't really do well. Could Rockies went to the playoffs that year, 95. Didn't really do well at the Coors Field. Kind of, and he got hurt. He still made a playoff start, I believe, for them. And then he ended up really fucking up. I believe it was his shoulder really bad. He ended up coming back with the Red Sox and was on their playoff teams, 98, 99. He was fantastic for them. His control was so good. One year, he almost had more wins than walks, which is crazy. And we know the Red Sox wouldn't let him finish games. Back then, people pitched complete games a lot. They would not let him pitch a complete game because he was so fragile. He'd get hurt so often. And eventually, I think in 2000, he retired. Now, why is he in the Hall of Fame? Well, a few guys from that era aren't. David Cohn's not in the Hall of Fame, who, should, who deserves it more than Saberhagen does. They just didn't compile enough stats. Saberhagen just didn't pitch for long enough. Now, he is such a interesting pitcher had great moments i hope unfortunately I, I i hope he never gets forgotten about i'm glad we're talking about him in the show for any younger listeners but he was absolutely a very important part of baseball history one world series two Cy youngs pitched on multiple playoff teams and if you were alive from 84 to I don't know, 2000 he was a big part of our lives like brett saber again was almost as famous as david Cohn. so brett saber not in the hall of fame he just didn't get enough wins but he's in the hall of like my heart like he's one of my favorite pitchers ever I hate the term Hall of Very Good now that I've ex- – now that I've just – like the older I get, the more I hear it. I'm like, eh. He's an easy one to say like Hall of Very Good, but is there like a Hall of Very, Very Good or is it just just maybe the reputation? Great career. Looking at the baseball reference page will really give you some – he's also in the scout. Brandon Frazier took him deep. 
a oh, bunch really? of times. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I think John Lovitz called him out of the bullpen. He was like, yeah, anyway, we're bringing Saberhagen a pitch to you. And he's like, who's this guy? Anyways, let's talk managers. Thank you for doing that segment. I'm going to have another one of those prepared for you. Because as I'm like reading about baseball stuff, and this happens more and more, the more we do more and more as we do the show, I'll see something and I'll be like, ooh, I wonder what Clummer thinks about that. So here's what I'm interested in what you think. Who's the first manager fired Major League Baseball? So I have five guys on my – I call it the gonzo seat. Guys that are – they're gone. They're, they're done, I, in my opinion. Can Two I guess of, them? You can guess it. Well, one of them's obvious. One of them has announced he's retiring today. It's Terry Francona. Terry Francona. So okay. we'll take that one. So I have four more on here. Want to guess them? Bud Black. I have him in my at risk, but I okay. think he probably should go. This is his fifth losing season in a row. He's going to lose 100 games this year. Um, I, I think he's a good manager. That's just a hopeless situation there. Buck Showalter. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, he's going to step down. Sure. Whatever. I mean, he's a I mean, man. Whatever. of Buck Showalter is a man of integrity and respect in baseball. He could manage the Mets to 100 losses for the next 10 seasons in a row, and he would still be widely respected across the game. People love Buck. By the way, did you know Buck hit like 480 at Mississippi State? I'm wearing Mississippi no. State baseball hat right now. Don't know he colleges at all. No. Led the country in hitting and was widely considered the best college hitter. He would have gotten drafted. He would have had a great professional career if he was any bigger. He just was in one of those eras where, like, if you were big, you hit for power. You know, like, there weren't a lot of small guys hitting for power. That's because body mechanics and just teaching in general. But Buck Showalter, if he played in today's game, would be like Ben Attendee. Oh. Like that. Um, okay, Showalter's out. You said Francona. Um, Phil Nevin? I have him in my gonzo, yeah. Phil Nevin's gonzo? I think so. I think the Angels need to completely – Figure shit out, and it's very easy to fire a manager. I mean, I, I, has Phil Nevin done a good job there? No, like, I think really? he's kind of a hard ass too. I wouldn't want to play for him. What about Bob Melvin? Is he on your list? Yeah, I think he's going to resign. Like Melvin and Buck both seem like they just don't want to be there anymore. Especially Melvin, if you watch, uh, he had a um, he was asking about why Josh Hader can only basically only is allowed to throw you know one inning and can't go for four outs, and he didn't even want to answer the question. He just looked disgusted. He just looks checked out. I've heard. I'm sure we both have heard a number of issues at that Padres clubhouse. That seems to be just a complete disaster show. Padres already said they're going to try to cut payroll. I can see them trying to fire, you know, or letting Melvin go, however they frame it, just to bring in a new face. Bob Melvin behind a closed door. I, I don't know any stories about him, but based on the interview he gave about Josh Hader only being available for three outs, I'm willing to stake my life on the fact that if you close the door and you just let Bob Melvin go, he probably loses his mind. Like the type of guy, if you sat him down, you had a couple of bourbons and a cigar, and was like, yeah. yo, so what's the story with the hater? He's probably like, let me tell you about that fucking pussy. You know, this, like he's such a clearly reserved to the media. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you guys. Sorry. That thing closes. I guarantee you Bob Melvin wants to cut Josh Hader's throat and thinks he's the biggest pussy in baseball. There's like no other way. You can't disrespect Bob Melvin more. Then being like, I'm only available for three outs. I mean, you. I don't think the door even needed to be closed before Bob Melvin to go off on Josh Hader. He was. He was. We could almost see him like biting his tongue in real time. He, he was ready to like rip this guy into shred. You could just see the disrespect just dripping out of his mouth as he talked <laughs> about Josh Hader. So yeah, I, I don't. And I think at times sometimes the game kind of passes you by. Like Bob Melvin's an older guy. I mean, I, Bob Melvin was a a catcher when I was a kid for the Red Sox and for a number of teams, kind of a journeyman kind of guy in the late 80s, early 90s. Like, he's been around a long time. I think he's – I think it's the game done for Bob Melvin. Same with Buck Showalter, too. I think these – they're just old guys. They manage different players in different times. Buck had a huge advantage when he was coming up as a manager because the database was in his head. So – all this stuff with front offices and platoons and matchups and pitchers is this. Buck Walter has like a Cooperstown first ballot Hall of Fame legendary memory, can tell you anything about any player that he's come across and odds and all this shit. He, he's just such a baseball whiz. And th- I think that component of being an advantage, it's still important as a manager. Yeah. But he had that when the game started when other teams didn't. And then the other thing with Bob Melvin, that just like calm, chill demeanor, observational – you can be that in today's game, but I don't know if you can be that as like an older guy. I think the older guy has to be this like sensei or like the Snicker Thompson vibe. I don't know if Mel- Melvin has that. 
Or maybe I'm just completely wrong, and the players he managed this year didn't go out and play hard for him. Who fu- who knows? Last manager on your list, is it Brett Boone? Uh, Aaron Boone, no. I, I only call him Brett Boone. We could be doing this show 15 years from now and he could win 10 World Series and I'll still call him Brett Boone. I'm sorry. I have him in my at risk. So I've talked to some Yankee people today around the office, you know, hubs and everything and kind of getting in. And Meek Phil knows some people at the Yankee stuff. And it sounds like he's not going anywhere. They love him there, which yeah. I don't, every sense of my like body tells me that that's doesn't make any sense. Like, they need to fire him. They're going to barely finish 500 if, in Milwaukee if they do. But it's, and I know it's mostly Cashman's fault, but like they're keeping, this guy has never even been to a World Series. That For Yankees, that's like, I, I, it sounds like they're going to keep him. I do you think there's something like Goodell is loved by NFL owners because he keeps heat off where the Yankees like Brett Boone because he just gets shit on in the media and he's like good enough for quotes? Like, is there, it's almost like he absorbs enough of the hate and does it well, maybe I don't, I'm, tr- I'm grasping at straws here of why anybody in ownership would value Aaron Boone. I'm, well, I'm at a loss. I have no idea. I'm completely, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I only put him in, I would, if I didn't, if I didn't have, you know, people in the office that are Yankee fans, I would, I would have put him in Gonzo. So I don't know. I, I'm completely lost. No, the other guy I have in my Gonzo, and maybe you know more about this than I do, uh, is, uh, Oli Marmel for the Cardinals. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's got to be gone, right? I just, I had thought already. Huh. I, I haven't thought about him in forever. Oh, talk about it for, as soon as the Cardinals are bad, they're so forgettable. He's, he's so far gone. And it makes you wonder, man. Mike Schilt, now he's on a, he, who's he? He's with somebody. I don't he's know. He's at somebody's bench. You know yeah. what? He's in fucking uniform for the Padres. Oh. That was a story out of the athletic. He's a consultant. Oh to A.J. Preller, but A.J. Preller has him in uniform in the dugout, like reporting back to A.J. Preller, who sounds like a sounds like a hardworking guy who's very dedicated and maybe not in tune with those around him. So he's so he's a spy. Yeah, basically, exactly with the article. Players had described him as such. But anyway, I got one for you. Yeah, I want to run by you. Am I at risk? Pedro Griffal. Too soon, but Chris Getz is in his first year. We're talking about the White Sox manager. He's just finished his first season taking over for Tony La Russa, who's an absolute shit show in his second season with the White Sox. It's been a horrible year. None of those players, though, didn't really have a hand in picking the roster. His quotes are bad. His sound bites are awful. He's as bad as you get in front of the media, but I know enough to know that like who what he says to me or uh, me, us, media, whoever, is not at all what he says to players. His sound bites are atrocious. One year on the job, I I don't think he's a good manager based on what I've seen at all. Like the team was significantly worse this year, an embarrassment. But you fire a guy after one year, trying to think of times that's happened. Oh, you know what? The Cubs did it to. I think the Cubs did it to Ricky Renneria when Joe yeah. Maddon became yep. available in 2015. The Red Sox did it to Ron Renicki. Renicki, I was mispronouncing his name. Ron Renicki, yeah. He was, um, he was, the Red Sox did to Bobby Valentine, too. Um, Bobby happens. Valentine managed his way out of a big payroll. The White Sox situation's brutal. Bobby but, Valentine was awful with that with that Red Sox. Oh, he was team. horrible. I, the White Sox situation's a disaster. I mean, you have Lance Lynn. You have Middleton saying this clubhouse is a shit show. There's no rules. There's some really weird shit about the White Sox clubhouse. That's and that's me here at a national level. I can only imagine in Chicago. It seems like a disaster. Yeah, I. Whew, okay, we're tall in lines here. That because that clubhouse is filled with guys that had like opinions and shit when Pedro got there. I'm sure he tried to feel it out and be cool. You know, I'm a manager. Didn't really have any success as a bench coach in Kansas City. Other than I, was he even on those 14, 15 teams? I don't know. I would not fire him. However, actually, I would fire him. Fuck it. If I'm Chris Getz, I'm going in there. The first thing I'm doing is firing him and bringing my guy in. That's what I mean. You yeah, that's the first guy. thing I would do. I would fire him. I I just I'm saying like from a hum- humanitarian standpoint, this guy's not even a year on a job. You know, I mean, bad year. Yo, Amakata was a dog before he got there. Eloy Jimenez was broken before he got there. Lance Lynn had a bad attitude before he got there. Tim Anderson was trying, you know. Well, Tim Anderson really regressed. Well, he has a lot of personal shit going on in his life. Baby mama drama stuff, getting knocked. Like, I, 
Liz, I should say this up front, clear anytime I open my mouth about Tim Anderson. I like we have a relationship. He's a friend. I like him. I like him as a person. I don't talk all the shit people want. I know him as a person. He's a fucking good ass fucking dude who lots to sit down and talk, chop up baseball. So there is the personal side. He's played terrible. He's one of the worst. He's had one of the worst seasons in baseball this year. And we're also talking about guys who won batting title. So it's not like, oh, Miles Master and Boney sucks. Like Tim Anderson is fucking awesome at baseball. Went healthy, went locked and loaded. <clears throat> so how, is Pedro Grafal responsible for that? I don't know. I'd fire him if I was Chris Getz, though. He has to. It's his first year on the job in your legacy. And like, this is your career to run the team and be the top dog. Like, you got to get your guy in there. If he doesn't like Pedro, I'd get rid of him right away. What would you do? I'd fire him. Okay, good. I mean, I just don't think he's been a good manager. Um, the other guy that this, I would have felt different about this a week ago, uh, Gabe Kapler is my, my at risk. There's been some stuff come out just today. Uh, Andrew Baggerly had an interesting article in the athletic. Um, I guess they play, they've been playing Bob Marley music after losses. Um, so they almost have like a theme music when they lose, uh, on top of it, I guess there is a, a game, a card game that everyone is, is obsessed with playing there to the point where like. Guys aren't like like Jock Peterson was even mentioned in the article. Oh, Jock uh, Peterson is is playing cards. Yeah, he ain't playing. He's he's in the card game, pal. And they're Fair. like he he won't even study the next day's opposing pitcher because everyone's so right. locked into this card game. Right. And I guess uh, like Wilmer Flores, Mike Yastrzemski, um, a couple other guys are trying to get these guys to rally around. Like, let's get focused, guys. Let's get let's get it together. And it's like if the, if the players have to do that, like where's the manager? Where's the leadership here? And you know this is. They're they're one game under 500 going into today. They had they were 81 and 81 last year. They're probably going to be about the same this year. Like, at which point is like it's just not working out with Gabe Kapler? The card game stuff is explosive. The potential there, the story, the underlying story, the culture of gambling and card and like in baseball is gig- It's gigantic. And stuff, if they're reporting on that, I'm trying, I don't want to, in my experience, it's way bigger than whatever the fuck they were reporting about. Oh, yeah. The ca- the cash amounts that are going on and like the games they're playing and the amount of games that are going on in the hours in which they're being played. But we're talking about guys like not going to bed. We're talking about guys just like pure addiction, right? So that's out there the sport lends itself to that due to the traveling and the camaraderie that you build. Right. And the isolation, it's just like, you're always negative. You're expecting bad shit to happen. Now, Gabe Kapler fostering that in, he's one of the guys. Maybe he's got one of those issues. He's one of those guys. He's, he, yeah, he played, he's young, he's fit. He looks like, you know, he's, he's part of your peer group in a sense. Like David Ross has not crossed that line with, with the Cubs players. He's like a real fuck you get out of my face kind of guy. Maybe Gabe Kepler is trying to be the cool mom. The Bob Marley I stuff I Gabe. wouldn't bring up. I would not talk about l- losing music. That's cool. Like you lose. Yeah. Throw on some Bob Marley, whatever. Dude. Oh, like, yeah, so you can't be playing music after you lose. Like, especially when you have like a theme song and you lose. They're pro athletes. They're not. They're playing cards until 2 a.m. or whatever. Like what, what's going on? But uh, so, pros. If it's a song that like turn the page, if guys are laughing after a loss, there's there's way to carry yourself after a loss. A, a song is not going to make me draw a conclusion. I, I think it's I think it's a bad look. The other thing too is Gabe Kapler. You know I'm I'm 43. I'm older than every single major league baseball player right now. It sucks. That's where I am. That's it. Gabe Kapler is five years older than I am. He's 48. If he's hanging out with the boys and hanging out with the guys, like dude, stop. Stop. He's a weirdo. He's always been weird. He's always been a weirdo, and I, I'm kind of surprised. He's always been super intense. So I'm kind of surprised he's letting this shit slide. I thought he'd be the one to be like, I'm going to take those cards and set them on fire in front of you. Like The Giants loved him. As soon as he got fired from the Phillies, I thought he got hired by the Giants. He was a quick... He did, and, he had, and then he wins 107 games. They win the division. Obviously, they lose in the first round. Tough battle there. You know, that, that happens. But then to come out of that season and have two, literally the definition of mediocre seasons. I mean, I just... I don't know. The stuff that came out of this the, the thing today... That's the kind of stuff that you leak right before you fire a manager. Smart thinking. See, I never think like that. 
that's good insight. And he could easily get fired. I mean, they didn't they get rolled up by the Dodgers when the season mattered the last weekend? Well, they've been playing. They've been. I think they're twenty and thirty over their last fifty. It's not a great roster. It's not a bad roster. But I don't like firing guys that have succeeded with better rosters, and then two years later, like the the all one team was good. The twenty one team, you mean? Did I say all one? Yeah, yeah, I meant to say twenty one. But the all one, the all one, the all one Giants team was actually pretty good too. Pell, look that team up. Yeah, it wasn't the O two team went to the World Series. The O one team must have been good, right? Dusty Baker managed it. That guy's winning 90 games a year. Oh my gosh. What, what, what was that? I'm going to pull it up right now. I, you don't like it when I do that. I just Dusty Baker. You Okay, I'm a huge Dusty Baker guy. All right. I mean, he won the World Series last year. So I've been... I've been, I've my been point, let's my, get back to the... Let's I've get been back putting to the my criticism in my back pocket. I will say he's another guy that... I'm not saying he's going to get fired, but I could see him being like, you know what? Like, I won last year... Let's say they make it to the whatever the ALDS this year. It's like, eh, it was good. Had a good run. I could see him just just because he's older. Anytime these guys hit a certain age, at any point it could be their last season. So he's another guy. You know, you always have those surprises too every every year of like, oh shit, that guy stepped down. Like Mike Schilt. Like holy shit, what well, other guy you know would have got an extension and said they let him go. So you never know what happens. But those are kind of the guys that I have my eye on. The teams that I kind of have I'm looking at. And I'm really curious to see what happens. Like, where's the turnover? Because guys like Showalter and Bob Melvin, those are – and Francona, those guys aren't getting another job. Those guys are done. So if those three guys are gone, we need to fill those spaces with, with new people. And, like, that point, who are the new faces? Sean Casey somewhere. Nah, you're going to see DeRosa. There's going to be former players. I think every new manager is going to be a former player. Does someone – see, I I thought they were going to – Yankees going to fire Boone – and bring Don Mattingly back. Mattingly currently the bench coach in Toronto. Um, I also thought if things went a different way for Toronto, they were going to fire Schneider. But I think that making the playoffs will keep him safe for another year. I think. They get swept in the wild card around there. Who knows? Would you fire him for Craig Council? Oh, I'd fire anyone for Craig Council. Craig Council, I want him coming here. I want him coming to New York. No, I'd fire just about anyone for Craig Council. Craig Council, there's a clip of this. And someone has seen it. Many of you have not. Of Craig Council in a grand slam or three run homer late. Immediately upon impact, you see the dugout jump up and celebrate. And Council does it. Council just sprints to the bullpen phone. And the story was that he changed relievers in that moment to sit the better reliever down and save him for tomorrow's game. And then yep. they ended up using him the next game. That's co- like, how else can I explain that to someone who doesn't watch and love baseball and understand the nuance of like, yo, biggest moment. And you sit around, you sit around all season waiting for like a late, late inning, go ahead, grand slam. This dude can't even celebrate it. He has to go manage the bullpen into a better decision for the club. Like, that shit just rocks me to my core. Saving his guy's bullets. Love it, dude. I mean, that's just good manager. I mean, that's, I mean, he does everything right. Like, he he has his guys. I mean, you never know. They're always the worry is you take that guy from this great situation, you put him somewhere new. I'm going to go way back. There's a guy named Johnny Keene, 1964. He won the World Series with the Cardinals. They were going to fire him before the season. Was over in September. They're going to fire him. They already the ownership already decided they're going to fire him. The Cardinals on this crazy run. They make the World Series. They beat the Yankees in seven games. The Yankees fire Yogi Berra, and uh, the Cardinals were going to give Johnny Keane an extension. Keane through back channels had an agreement with the Yankees. Went and told the Cardinals, "Fuck you! You're going to fire me. Fuck you! Take this job and shove it." He goes to the Yankees, ends up finishing in sixth place in 1965. Gets off to a four and sixteen start in sixty. 66, he gets fired. He's dead in 1967. Heart attack dies. Of <laughs> it's a true story. There's, there was no way that story was ending without a death. No. Johnny Keene. He, he's, like, he's like in his like late 50s. Wasn't that old? But he was, and I guess until the very last moments of his life, he was just blaming himself and hating the Yankees and hating himself for taking this job. 
just had bad, once again, goes back to the secret of life, good timing, he had bad timing. He got the Yankees right when they got old, right at the wrong time. And uh, yeah, but so sometimes the situation you're in isn't always the worst place to be. Well said. And you gave good life advice, this show. That's what I'm here you're, for. You're generally, yeah, you're, you, you do a good job at that. You know, these gray hairs, they got to be good for something. If you had, last question of the show, and let's just, as quick, as quick as you want to take this. Would you rather be a manager or a general manager? GM. Okay. So uh, if you go back to my junior high, you asked what people want to be when they grew up. I said I want to be I want to be a big league manager. I don't want to be shortstop. I want to be the manager. But as I got older, I saw a GM. So I played this baseball simulator almost every night uh, where I am the GM. And I, I do mock expansion drafts. I make trades. I go back and revisit old teams that maybe had like one small thing wrong with them. Like the, 90, like the Mariners in the 90s had like no starting pitching. So I try to fix that. Or I'll take the Indians who had who had like good pitching but never had that ace. So I try to trade for an ace. I always am trying to like look at trades. Every time I look at anything baseball, I'm like, how can I make this team better? So yeah. I you- wanted to be a GM when I was younger. If you asked me in high school, my mom gave me money ball when I was a sophomore in high school. And she's, you know, she, we have that relationship. You should read this. This is good for you. And I was so turned on to the idea of being a GM and working in a front office. It was all I thought about when I was playing college baseball at the University of Illinois. Uh, like I was, oh my god, I can't wait! This is on my resume. I'm studying accounting. I'm I'm gonna get a job in the White Sox front office because I got friends who know people who are. And then you work your way up, and I, like I'm gonna do all this stuff. And I carried that with me into law school, into my second fucking year of law school. It was like I'm gonna do this, this, this. And then it was like, that, that is actually impossible. I met Tom Ricketts at a charity event and bluntly asked him, would you consider giving me a job? And what would it take for you to consider that? Just right when I met him, you know, here's, here's my elevator pitch. And he's like, well, you'd have to know the right people. And I said, I can't imagine there's a better person to know than you. And I just introduced myself to you. So what, now that I know you, what would it, what would it take? And he was like, it just comes down to knowing the right people. I remember I was so turned off by that interaction. My point is I, I had tried and put myself out there and did all this send letters to teams and this is who I am. And so like I will always, always hold a grudge against Scott Harris for writing a letter to Theo Epstein and three years later, three years later getting a phone call from that letter being like, hey, I'd like to hire you to be my chief of staff in Chicago. Like, fuck you, Scott Harris. You're the guy who got the phone call. I wrote those letters. Now as I'm older say like older, I would not in a thousand years want to work in a front office. I can't, I would kill to be back in the dugout. I would kill to be a manager, a bench coach, a chart guy, just to be a part of the day to day and the wins and the losses. I want to be there for guys just as like for those losses, just as much as when you win and how close those bonds are. It's, it's closer than it's, it's impossible to describe when you go through so much like failure and struggle and shitty travel and all this stuff, this is my really long winded. I said, be quick, but I can't, I can't. When I talk about this stuff, I would, I would manage, I would love to manage. And if it wasn't manage pitching coach, but pitching coaches have too much responsibility, maybe hitting coach, even though I don't know, lick fucking keep your elbow up, kid. <laughs> I don't know shit about hitting, but, um, I'd I want to be in the dugout. I want to be with the guys competing. I want to be with the guys who don't give a fuck what the numbers say. They're just like, next one's mine. It's a great way to go through life. I don't think I'd want to do either right now. Well, I know. I think I, hey, I, I, I like you're hot. You're as hot as anybody at Barstool. Everybody loves true. Clummer. That's not true. I, I think I would. I, I I like just talking baseball. Like the like the idea of like having to travel that much, and the idea of like being away from like my wife and my dogs, and like and just the idea of like. I don't know. Like, I always think like, it'd be cool to be like an announcer, like to do like play by play. But like, I would be, I would be fired in a week. Like, I'm, I just, I like to say how I feel about things, and that would get me fired like instantly. Like, I would be like, this guy sucks. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? And like, that made me can. Maybe down the road, like thirty years from now, they'll have alternative broadcasts where we can do things like that. I think we're going that direction as like a media landscape, sports media world. But until that happens, like, I don't know, like, kind of just like having the free form and the creativity, you know, creative freedom, like Barstool gives us, like, we can, like, write blogs or whatever we want. And, like, as long as we're being fair and honest, usually it gets posted. And, like, we can have a fair and discussion, fair and honest discussion here. 
Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty kidding. One thing I do think about though is I had a time machine. I would go back in time and I would become a GM of a team. Now I already know which player is going to be great. And I would build this crazy dynasty and I would no. win year after year after year after year because I know Mickey Mantle is going to be great. I know, you know, Catfish Hunter is going to be awesome. I know Bob Bibbins great and I get these guys and I just become the greatest mind of all time. And everyone builds statues of me. Isn't that Biff from Back to the Future 2? He has an almanac to gamble. I want to build these teams. I wouldn't even need almanac. I know who the great players are. And I would and I would just build this amazing team. And I and, and people would talk about me forever. No, he's not buying Berkshire Hathaway, folks. He's he's not getting on the ground floor of IBM. No, I wouldn't he's, no. he's, he's trading he's trading Fernando Fell in Venezuela before his shoulder. That's blows. right. That's right. You everyone laughs. I'd be like, no. how did this guy do it again? No, I'll say let me say something serious to close the show. Thanks for tuning in, guys. This is Barstool Baseball. You brought it up asking GM manager if you had a you know, whatever. You like talking baseball for a living. I can't, you know, this is more for the audience than it is for you because I know you're a cold, cold prick. But like it's so fucking good talking cl- baseball with Clemmer. There, there's like literally never a time I have to catch him up, speed him up, explain myself. Or anything. I've talked baseball. I've like ruined social constructs based on my passion for talking baseball. People are like stay away from that guy. He's just gonna talk your <laughs> fucking ear off about baseball. That sounds familiar. Um, yeah. So like in a in a not. It's not like I've met my match because that makes me sound arrogant. But I just can't tell you how much I fucking like talking baseball with you. It's just great. This is a great show. Coming off to say a Suzuki drop, like there was a moment there where I forgot about it. Like there was a moment in the yeah, show where know. I wasn't haunted <laughs> by a historical, awful play from the Cubs. But it happened. Do me a favor. Subscribe to the show. Give me a boost, guys. Also, a little bonus thing here. I started a YouTube channel yesterday. And I recorded an hour-long Cubs conversation with with one of my close friends. We, I went out to his garage in Arlington Heights, Illinois. He's a diehard Cubs fan. And we just went through, like, a bunch of questions rapid fire. So for people that are like, dude, spend more time on the Cubs, we're trying to carve that out as we go. But right now, this is Barstool Baseball. It's a national show. I'm with an A1 fucking gangster baseball guy and Chris Clemmer. Please subscribe to the show. We're going to be back, I believe, on Friday or Sunday with Power Rankings playoff coverage. Bunch of shit coming. I got to go get some fucking rest. Thanks for tuning I got, in. I got, before you go, I got some good news for you, though, Carl. I know you said you forgot about the Suzuki drop for a second, but the good news is if the Cubs make the wild card, you'll be able to watch it for the next 50 years. I mean, you just do – you just – all right, no one's dying. I, I got to relax here. You son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Clemmer sucks. <laughs> <laughs>